Thank you so much for that excellent lecture. Um, it raised a lot of questions for me, one of which I would like to ask in two, ask in two parts, if I may, which is to ask you about the relationship between consciousness, memory, and identity. And in the second part, the relationship between conscious, individual consciousness and collective consciousness. Thank you. <clears throat> the relationship between consciousness and memory, I think, is... is is very complex and it plays out in many different ways, partly because there are many different kinds of memory. Um, one of the most obvious contexts this plays out in is in, is in episodic memory. So the, you know, the memory of past events that are personally relevant to you, where you were yesterday, where you were a year ago. And one, there's some, I didn't focus on it today much at all, but there's some very famous case studies in the medical history. Many of you might have heard of the patient HM, um, who had his hippocampus, part of the brain that's responsible for laying down uh, these episodic memories, removed. So for many decades, HM could not lay down any new memories. This had the effect that he was kind of living in this present all the time. Uh, he still had other kinds of, of memory. He could learn new motor tasks, learn to draw, and, and so on. But his sort of personal narrative, his narrative self, kind of stopped at the moment that he had that, that surgery. This doesn't mean he lost consciousness. What it means is that he, he was clearly still conscious for the rest of his life, which lasted many decades. But the one specific part of being a conscious self was, was, no, longer, was no longer there. Uh, there's another case, Clive Wearing, who much the same thing due to a, a disease rather than a surgery. And he was, he had, was famous for having a seven-second memory to start with, and, and that was it. He lived in this present. It also meant that he couldn't... When you, when you can't remember episodes in the past, it's also more difficult to project yourself out into the future. So it's as if there's a symmetry that memory is really about the ability for mental time travel to the past or the future. But what's essential is you still, you still are conscious, and many of your aspects of being a conscious self are preserved. You still have a first-person perspective, you still have a body, you still feel in control of your actions, but one aspect has gone. So memory, I think, plays uh, a significant but it, a role, but it's not completely essential. And the second question, very briefly, between individual consciousness and collective consciousness, well, the consciousness, I don't think there's anything like a single conscious entity made up of lots of people. However, I think it's very clear that the way I experience being me does depend on how I experience others as experiencing me. Other people are the most salient objects in the world. Now, of course, that's not always the case, and I know there are some experts in this audience on conditions like autism, where that seems to be somewhat different, that at least perception of others' mental states might not come so naturally. But again, it's not, it's not that people who... who perceive others' mental states less clearly are in any sense less conscious. It's just their conscious self is, is, is a different kind of thing. Is, is there anyone a bit further up? I was going to... Um, perhaps a gentleman on the other side, actually, sorry, um, Debs, in the blue shirt. Thank you. And tie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested in your comment about octopuses and their arms, which do have complex neural networks, and also relating that to the experiments on humans with damage to the corpus callosum, where it's often the case that one side of the brain seems to be aware of facts about the outside world that hmm. the other side is not. Is there any evidence that brains can support discrete, separate, conscious subsystems, that, so there's more than one consciousness within a single <coughs> brain? It's a very, very good question. Um, and perhaps the best evidence of something like that is in these uh, so-called split-brain patients um, who had their corpus callosum severed in order to relieve intractable epilepsy. And in cases like that, indeed, you would, you would sometimes see uh, a dissonance between the two cortical hemispheres. One would try to stop the other from doing something. Uh, the difficulty in interpreting something like that is that... Um, is that usually only one hemisphere was reporting what was going on, that, that sort of, because language is often lateralized. However, I, th I, I, 
it, it, seems, it seems entirely possible to me that, that you can have two uh, consciousnesses within, within one skull. I mean, there's another kind of opposite example. There are very rare cases of people, of twins born with, with their skulls fused together. So they have almost separate bodies, but now they're sharing a brain and there's very interesting questions there about, well, what, what's the, is there a single uh, conscious self in, in, in that situation? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think there's anything in principle. Even within a, you, your, your brain now and my brain now, there is the possibility that, that there may be parts of my brain supporting conscious contents that other parts of my brain don't know about. And there's some quite difficult arguments that you can have there about, is can my visual cortex be conscious of something without the front of my brain knowing about it? Um, the problem is, how do you do an experiment to test that? Uh, let's take some questions on this side. Um, in the front row, please, Debs. Thank you. <coughs> you mentioned in your talk about the idea that one's perception of oneself usually is somewhere in, in your body, usually kind of about there. Can you shed any light on what, you know, why we sometimes feel that we're not there, we're some, somewhere outside the body? So this is a question about out-of-body experiences, perhaps. Um, I think it's a, it's a great question because uh, it's easy to dismiss something like an out-of-body experience as just inconsistent with the precepts of science. It requires some sort of dualistic idea that the soul has left the body and is floating around somewhere. I think, you know, well, that's not what's going on, but it's also not a, the right way to think about it. People report out-of-body experiences, so let's trust their reports. But let's come up with a, a, a better explanation for, for what might be going on. Now... Um, it turns out you can induce out-of-body experiences in the lab. And uh, you, by extensions of things like the rubber hand illusion, for instance, if you wear a, a, a VR headset and have a camera behind you so that the input you're getting is of your own, of the back of your body, and then you do this simultaneous stroking business again, some people will perceive their first-person perspective as having shifted um, to a point behind them. And in fact, if you or I wear these VR goggles and we swap the input, so I see myself through your eyes and vice versa, and then we shake hands, then we might also experience uh, an exchange of self-location. There are many different kinds of... Uh, in, without these experimental manipulations, people report a graded series of out-of-body experiences as well. There's autoscopic hallucinations where they see their body, but they still feel their body to be where they are, and then haotoscopic um, situations where you feel that your self-location is changing between where you are and where you perceive your body double to be, and apparently Dostoevsky um, was very troubled by this. But at heart, I think the same mechanisms apply, that we, our brain gets information about where it makes most sense to locate its first-person perspective, and that's where we see the world from, and it's normally where we are, but, but there's nothing hard and fast, and if there's sufficient evidence against that, well, go with the evidence. Okay, so I'd like to ask someone up in the gallery, um, uh, just there, if you see right centrally. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. And I was really struck by your perspective of unconsciousness. I predict myself, therefore I am. And what's striking to me about that perspective is that it is as fully applicable to us human beings as it would be to an autonomous robot that exists right now. Yet, as, as conscious living beings, our experience of consciousness seems to be essentially different from that of a robot. Is there something essential that the predictive, almost mechanistic view of consciousness is missing? So I think there is actually this idea of predicting oneself points to one of the big differences between robots as they are now or even as we imagine they might be in a few years and us. Uh, because a sort of more standard view might be, okay, well, you've got a robot, it's got a very fast computer in there, and you've got to have run the right program, and it'll be conscious. And it's all about how it processes the external things in the world. 
most robots or machines that we build don't care about their own persistence over time. They don't have predictive models that are, that are in the business of preserving some sort of deep, deeply physiological integrity about themselves. Uh, they lack a physiology. And um, I think that you know, there is no reason why we do not, we cannot build systems that have, if you like, a kind of physiology that care about their own persistence and where everything else follows from that, that the way they perceive the world becomes a consequence of a more fundamental imperative to stay alive. But that's very different from the kinds of machines that we're building at the moment. The question is, if we were to build such a machine, would it, would it be conscious? The answer to that is, is, I don't know. I don't think that in itself is, is sufficient either, because that's still a functional description of what's, of what's going on. But certainly by building systems like that, we'll sharpen our intuitions about what are the remaining differences, because you know, only by building something do we really understand how it works. Uh, over this side now, just, um, thank you. just wait for the microphone to come, please. Um, you mentioned when consciousness arises in babies. So has there been a lot of experiments done in this area about the, when newborns develop a sense of self-awareness and what this can tell us about the development of the brain and consciousness? Uh, there's been a lot of work done on, on, on some specific aspects of, of consciousness in infants, and especially the development of self-awareness. So a classic method there is the mirror self-recognition test. You, when does a baby recognize that the image in a mirror is of itself and not of something else, another person? This is actually also applied to animal, non-human um, animal consciousness too. And we, you know, there's, there's discussions, but the consensus is that takes at least a year, possibly two years, before you have something like that, um, possibly more. There's been surprisingly little work done on other aspects of, of consciousness in babies. For instance, their ability to be perceptually conscious, to be conscious of a visual scene. Some work's been done by um, a group led by Sid Quidere in Paris, where they look for some of the same neurophysiological markers that we know exist in, in adult humans when we consciously perceive something. There are things like a, what we call a P300, which is a, a, sign, a sign in the EEG, 300 milliseconds after a brief stimulus. If that's there in adult humans, that's a good sign that we've consciously seen something. If you look in, in, in um, neonates and newborn babies, you see something which is intriguingly in the middle. You know, in some cases, you'll see a late, slow response in the EEG. It doesn't look much like it does in an adult human, but it's also suggestive. Part of the issue there is that the, the, you know, the newborn brain is very, very different from the adult brain. One thing is there, aren't any of these, there are very few of these fast connections linking long-range different parts of the brain together, so you wouldn't expect to see the same thing anyway. Uh, but I quite like William James' idea about what it is to be a baby, which is that you know, we... We have to learn so much about how to interpret sensory data. In fact, we probably have to learn that the different senses are in fact different. And he called the world of the newborn this blooming and buzzing confusion, as if we haven't developed the predictive models at that point to distinguish what's visual from what's, um, from what's tactile or from what's auditory. I'll just take one more question, actually, um, uh, over this side, I think, because I was only one over the side. I'm trying to be fair in terms of the sections of the audience. A uh, gentleman with, the, with his hand up, now please. Yeah, brilliant and, and fascinating. Just, um, I heard um, Daniel Dennett um, speak here, who made the point that there wasn't a hard problem of consciousness. And um, I thought that was interesting because obviously, you know, does a microorganism move from the light to the dark or vice versa? Is that a level of consciousness? There's a clear development um, going upwards. Um, as you correctly said, chimpanzees, elephants, other dolphins and recognize themselves. Isn't it just an evolutionary development rather than some sort of, you know, humans obviously think they're special, but I mean, they were homo, <coughs> um, you know, a, a whole load of other species that would have recognized themselves and had that 
internal recognition and so so what why do they call it a hard problem and do you disagree with Daniel Dennett uh, you save the easy question for last right that's that's um, uh, yeah I think to just a couple of responses to that I, I, I think one of the res there is this resistance to thinking that there, that we can explain consciousness in, because it's it will also, in one way, make us less special. But that's always been the thing. In humanity, we try to cling on to this idea that we're somehow special and different. And we aren't really that different or that special. But that's a good thing rather than a bad thing. Now, is there a hard problem? Do I agree with Dennett? Well, I read Dennett's book when I was an undergrad in 1991, Consciousness Explained. It's brilliant. It was kind of unfairly critiqued as consciousness explained away by a lot of people because... There's this, there's this, you know, this set of arguments which I think try to convince you that when we, if we're trying to understand how consciousness happens, we're trying to solve the wrong problem, and that we may have the wrong intuitions about what the explanatory targets of the science of consciousness should be. And I think his arguments there can be very good about what might be reconstructed post hoc. You know, we, when, when is, does our conscious experience happen? Does it happen now? Is it partly reconstructed from the past, partly projected into the future? But um, a wise friend once told me that you should always listen to philosophers' questions, but never to their answers. 